Your Honor, calling People v. Ethan Crumley, case number 2022-279-506 FC. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. Appearances for the record. Karen McDonald for the People. Thank you, Mark Keast on behalf of the People. David Williams on behalf of the People. Paulette Michelle Lofton on behalf of Ethan Crumley. Jimmy Happ on behalf of Ethan Crumley. Thank you. You all may be seated and good afternoon to council. With that being said, before we broke for lunch, the people had rested. With that being said, defense, do you have any witnesses? We do, Your Honor, we do. Thank you. You may call your first witness. We call Dr. Kenneth Romanowski. Thank you. Doctor, you're going to approach the witness stand. You're going to stand in the witness box. Face my clerk to be sworn, sir. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. Under penalty of perjury, do you swear or affirm the statements you're about to make to this court will be the whole truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Please have a seat. You may be seated, sir. Thank you. And sir, if you could please state your full name for the record and spell your last name. Yes, it's Kenneth Arthur Romanowski, R-O-M-A-N-O-W-S-K-I. Thank you. With that being said, sir, if you could please keep your voice up for me. I would greatly okay. appreciate it. Very good. Thank you. Defense, your witness. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Dr. Romanowski, can you tell me a little bit about your formal education, please? Yes, I have a bachelor's, a master's, and a doctorate degree from the University of Michigan. All of them are from University of Michigan? Yes, they are. And what is your bachelor degree in? Bachelor's was in social sciences and history. Did you have a specific major? Uh, that was the major. Social in, science? Yes. What about your master's? The master's was guidance and counseling. And your uh, PhD? Counseling and community agencies. And Pursuant to that and your employment, do you have any sort of state licensing? Um, master social worker, but that needs to be renewed. And are you a member of any professional associations, and if so, which ones? Michigan Correction Organization and the uh, American Corrections Association. Can you tell us a little bit about your employment, please? Yes, I worked, uh, started work in the corrections field as a juvenile uh, care worker in a juvenile facility in 1975. Uh, did that for about a year, then I worked in a group home for juveniles. Uh, this was for juveniles being released from the boys' training school, and also for uh, boys that were uh, coming into the system from other avenues, but most of these were troubled youth coming into the facility who had been in some form of detention. In 1977, excuse me, 1979, I began working with the Department of Corrections. I was hired in as an agent in charge at a halfway house for offenders being released from prison. They were actually released on prison status, and they were uh, stayed there for roughly a year or two while they found employment and maintained their family ties, and then they were finally released on the parole. And part of that, after that, I went to work with the Genesee County probation office, where I was a probation officer, and I did that uh, for a few years, and then I went back to the correction center as agent in charge, excuse me, as a supervisor, and then later as a manager of both the uh, uh, halfway house and the uh, parole office in Genesee County. And what um, positions have you held as a deputy or a warden? Okay. Yes, uh, I began working as a deputy warden at the uh, Hiawatha Correctional Facility up in the Upper Peninsula. And uh, I worked there for roughly <coughs> two years and I transferred over to the Kinross Correctional Facility. And uh, this was from 93 through just about the year 2000, 2001. And after eight years in the Upper Peninsula, I transferred back down state, uh, just a short period of time at Detroit and then over to the Huron Men's Facility, which was in Ypsilanti. And since that time, I've worked at uh, numerous different facilities throughout the state, uh, probably eight different uh, correctional facilities. 
And in your positions as deputy warden or warden, have you been involved in the management of prisoners who are referred to as juvenile lifers? Yes, I have. And do you have any sort of teaching experience? Yes, I did. I taught with uh, Siena Heights College. And what did you teach? I taught corrections, introduction to corrections. And did you also teach with the University of Detroit? Yes, prior to that I taught corrections also for the University of Detroit. Now have you ever testified in a courtroom before? Yes. And have you ever been qualified as a witness? Or, yes. I'm sorry, an expert? Yes, I have. And can you tell us where you've been qualified as an expert? Uh, this would have been out of Kent County, Judge uh, Trusak's court. And how many times have you been qualified as an expert? Twice. And the third time I was uh, not necessary, the settlement which we reached. And those two times were both in Kent County? Yes. And would those have been both times involving cases where the issue was whether to sentence someone as a, a juvenile to life in prison without parole? Actually, these were the after the fact. These were offenders that had actually been incarcerated for a lengthy period of time as juvenile lifers and were looking at possible sentence reductions under the JWLOP. Now is there a certain um, theory or method, methodology you use for evaluating cases involving life without parole sentences? Generally I look at their entire record from the time they come into the system uh, up to the time they're doing the report. And I look at their misconduct history, what, what they've done since they were in prison, I look at what programs they're involved in, uh, which of the core programs they completed for the Department of Corrections, uh, what their education was, whether or not they completed their uh, high school education while they're in prison. Um, looked at their employment. Did they maintain employment while they were in prison? Your Honor, at this time I'd like to qualify Dr. Romanowski as an expert in corrections. No objection, Your Honor. Thank you. This witness will be reflected as an expert in the area of corrections. You may proceed. Now, Dr. Romanowski, this case is a little different, correct? That is correct. And could you describe how it's different? Well, it's different in that the Miller hearing is being held before the person is sentenced, where the other ones I've worked with, and I've done reports, and I have several are pending, probably about a dozen have all been with the offender being, uh, having his Miller hearing after he was sentenced instead of prior. And... Just kind of briefly, that's because Miller brought about a change in the law, correct? Correct. And so people that had been sentenced as juveniles to life without parole then had the opportunity to be released, correct? Correct. And in your work, are you familiar with the Miller factors? Yes, for the most part. In particular, you're familiar with the one involving rehabilitation, would that be true? Yes, potential for rehabilitation and maturity or immaturity of the offender. Have you reviewed any sort of documents regarding Ethan Crumbly? Yes, I have. And what types of documents have you reviewed? For the most part, the documents I reviewed were his jail records. And is it customary for you to consider those types of records in your role as a witness? Generally, when I'm considering those records, it's in addition to the Department of Corrections records. But in this case, all I had were the records from Oakland County Jail. And have you ever met or interviewed Ethan Crumbly? No, I have not. And you don't know information as to some of the factors, for example, his home life or family environment, correct? Only from what I read in the news. Thank you. Now, did you repair, prepare a report in this matter? Yes, I did. Your Honor, it's exhibit number J for the record. And do you have a copy of that report with you? Yes, I do. Now, Ethan is a juvenile placed in the county jail here in Oakland County, correct? Correct. What does that mean for him? Well, what that means for him is uh, obviously he's being considered as an adult for sentencing, and uh, that, that is part of it, but it's also the fact that uh, or the charges, I'm sorry, but it's also due to the fact that he is a juvenile in an adult facility, so he has to main, be maintained uh, under strict observation at all times. He has to be kept from any person over the age of 18. And part of this is the PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act requirements. 
And we've heard um, with respect to Ethan the phrase out of sight and sound. Can you explain what that means? Uh, what that basically means is that you have to remain out of sight and sound of an adult offender. And if you are not, you have to be in direct supervision with a custody staff member. Now, are you familiar with the Oakland County Jail, the physical, physical structure? No, I am not. Okay. To your knowledge, do the county jails have um, cell blocks designated for juveniles that are placed there? There may be some jails that do, but I'm not familiar if they are. I do know in this case here, uh, he was placed in the clinic area. Now, are you familiar with the term suicide watch? Yes, I am. And in reviewing your, the records regarding Ethan, um, has Ethan ever been on suicide watch? Yes, several times while I was in the Oakland County Jail. And what does suicide watch consist of? Uh, it's basically direct observation. Uh, they're recorded every 15 minutes, but I believe they also put him on the camera, so he's constantly under view of the staff member. And is that a little bit different from something called active behavior watch? Uh, yes, it is, but the two in terms of the amount of frequency of checks are the same. They're every 15 minutes. Is Ethan subject to active behavior watch? He has been most of his time he's been in the jail. Matter of fact, all the time if it wasn't suicide. Okay. And that means somebody's checking on him, you said, every 15 minutes? That is correct and they do something to notate what they've checked or what they've observed? Yes, it's on the active suicide watch sheet, and these are recorded every 15 minutes, plus whether or not he was standing, sitting, laying, whatever. Do you know what commissary is? Yes. What is that? Commissary is basically where you can order up items for yourself if you have the funds to pay for them, such as snacks, and I think in Ethan's case, he ordered quite a few snacks out of the commissary, and that's why he wasn't eating his meals. And that also involves um, hygiene items, correct? Yes, it does. You can buy soap, shampoo, deodorant. Um, clothing, such as socks and T-shirts? I believe so. Okay. Now, are you familiar with the term privilege as it's used in the jail or prison environment? Yes, privileges uh, in the jail and prison are going to be a little bit different, but I believe in his case he was under administrative segregation type setting, I meaning he was not released from his cell, so his privileges would have been basically um, his visits, his phone time, uh, maybe his use of the tablet, which all the offenders have provided use of the tablet, and possibly his movies and his television. Now, you just mentioned administrative segregation. Does um, Ethan get to go outside? Does he have that opportunity? I'm not sure if the jail has an outside pen or not, but if so, it would be under a caged area. Does he get a recreation time if it's perhaps inside instead yes, outside? Yes, I believe he does, yes. And do you know about how many times a week or how long? I believe it's one hour per day. And did you see any records where Ethan takes advantage or doesn't take advantage of that opportunity? For the most part, he did not take advantage of that. Now, those records you reviewed, do those also reflect that he was diagnosed with a mental illness? I saw in the records where he was being seen by a psychiatrist, but I did not have any mental health records to review. Okay. The records you reviewed, did they show that he was compliant with taking his medication? Not always, but it looked like for the most part he was. And uh, more frequently than not, he took it? I am guessing, again, this is based upon the, the uh, suicide watch sheets. They'll note that. And also the observation sheets will note that, too. There's a box they check if the meds are taken. In some cases, it was left blank, so either I assumed he was no longer on meds or they just didn't record it. But I would say about half and half. Now, it doesn't say what the medication is or what it's for, though, correct? No, it does not. Um, now, you mentioned you noticed from the records he was participating in some sort of counseling? Um, yes, he was in counseling with a therapist. He was seeing a therapist. Now, what kind of counseling he was in, I couldn't tell you. Um, did that increase or decrease in, frequently, or in frequency? I believe he was seeing the uh, psychiatrist once a week. And... Um, 
he's consistently participated with that therapist, correct? Yes, I don't think he's refused to see the psychiatrist. Now, um, you mentioned he'd been on suicide watch several times. Is that a result of some sort of report that's been made about him experiencing suicidal thoughts? Yes, those reports are found in the IMAX system. I'm not sure what IMAX stands for, but it's generally the find reports from the jail. The find reports are the incident reports that occur. And these are a little bit more detailed in terms of his behavior while he's in the jail. And there were several occasions where he had either uh, done something towards self-harm, uh, such as uh, hitting his head into the wall or uh, ramming his head into the door or possible suicide behavior. There's one occasion where he was uh, on his bunk with his uh, his uh, shirt tied around the speaker and then his shirt tied to that and it was believed he was trying to hang himself uh, but uh, it says also that he said he was just trying to muffle the noise and there was in fact a report of maybe a week prior that he was trying to muffle the noise. Now you mentioned IMAX. Is that something you had access to as well? Yes, I had the, those were the fine results, generally. And um, in those records, did you see that he had been reporting, um, hearing voices and being paranoid? Yes, I did. And what about any sort of indication of delusional behavior or paranoia before uh, the incident? Prior to the, uh, the murders, he was, in fact, hearing voices, I believe, at his home. His parents had reported that he had some delusional behavior and he had some fear about staying in the home because of uh, persons coming out of different rooms. Now, you've mentioned misconduct. Um, between November and December of 2021, were there any instances of misconduct that you found in the records? No, there were not. How about any misconduct in the entire year of 2022? No, none that I noticed. Did you notice any sort of misconduct in the year 2023? Yes, I did. That's uh, all the misconduct that I found was in those years. And what types of misconduct were, was that? Okay. The misconducts, by the way, all occurred within about a three-month period from uh, February through May of 23. And for the most part, the misconducts were what we would call minor rule violations in the Department of Corrections, but should be noted, the Oakland County Jail does refer to them as formal misconducts. Uh, these misconducts would include uh, items, uh, such things as making items out of toilet paper, which were dice, and then making a checkerboard to uh, roll the dice or a game board to roll the dice on. Uh, another occasion, he, in fact, uh, had his window that they look in, the deputies look into a cell blocked with cardboard boxes and, uh, and also trash bags. They were taken down, but he put them back up, so they just took them out of the room. Uh, there was another incident in which his password was given to another inmate so that inmate could make phone calls uh, to his relatives. Uh, he'd obviously either used his or didn't have the credits for the, uh, the phone calls. Okay, so let me stop you there for a minute. As it relates to phone usage, you have to have some sort of credits that, does that cost money? I believe it does in the county jail. And you are assigned some sort of a number or password <laughs> that you then put in the phone as you're making an outgoing call? That is correct. Obviously, you don't receive incoming calls, correct? No, you do not receive incoming calls uh, unless it's maybe from your attorney. Now, um, have there been any instances where his cell wasn't as clean as the deputy thought it should be? Probably most incidents. Okay. And you mentioned that here in the county jail, they have a different significance than they do in the Department of Corrections, correct? Yes, they're uh, at a different level. The, these probably would correlate to a major misconduct in the county jail. Whereas within the Department of Corrections, they would be minor misconducts or even violation of posted rules, which would be like a summary dis ticket. Kind of like a speeding ticket instead yes. of a misdemeanor. Yes, and he did receive three misconducts for not having his room clean. Now, when he's received misconducts, what sort of punishment has there been? Loss of privileges. 
And those would be the ability to use the tablet, watch TV, things like that. Exactly. And would loss of privileges also be the type of discipline he would be subject to in the Department of Corrections? It would be very similar, except for he would probably have more privileges he could end up losing because he would have time out of his cell. There may be different activities or programs he could be attending and he may not be able to attend depending upon whether or not it was recreational or personal program or whether or not it was department required program. Now, when somebody gets transferred from the jail to the Department of Corrections and they're a juvenile, do you expect to see or has your experience been to see um, a number of misconducts? Yes. Uh, most offenders, when they come into the system, uh, the Department of Corrections, is, especially the juveniles, will pick up a, a good series of tickets to their, their first several years. In fact, uh, may even be, depending upon what year they come in, uh, but they will pick up tickets all the way until they're about 26, and then it's like somebody flips the switch. Those greatly decline at that point. And um, based on your experience and your knowledge, is there a reason those individuals may have more tickets at the outset? I believe in part is because they are coming in as immature individuals and they are learning to become adults and understand the responsibility and the consequences of those misconducts. Uh, also, I think in many cases the individuals are coming in as rebellious about being in prison. Uh, they're just realizing that they are not going to serve a long, long term. And uh, this, when this hits home, they uh, act out negatively and in some cases they'll do this too to show that they're try to show that they're a tough guy so that people don't mess with them uh, by either uh, being insolent towards staff or possibly even uh, fighting with other inmates and I, I refer to a ticket when you get a misconduct the way you're notified of any sort of discipline is through something called a ticket, would that be correct? Yes, a ticket, misconduct, basically the same thing. And I guess the easiest way to talk about what you were just saying is um, some people have kind of a bravado in getting tickets so they don't become prey in the system, correct? That could be another reason too, yes. So they're not preyed upon, so they're, again, showing they're not to be messed with. And in the review of the records you completed, were you able to tell whether Ethan has been participating in any sort of education programming? Yes, I believe he was working on his uh, high school education, his GED. He was working on it through the tablet. And I believe he paid for this himself, at least that's what the jail records show, that there was money that was uh, put into his account and uh, that money was used to pay for the GED tablet, and there were four different courses he was taking toward uh, taking his TABE, his, his uh, test for adult basic education, prior to taking the GED. And do you know how far he was able to go in that program? Official records, no, but from what I understand is that he was able to get up to the point of taking the TAVE, -T -E, the TABE, but it needs to be proctored as well as the GED need to be proctored and the jail was not able to accommodate the uh, proctor. Is that something the Department of Corrections can accommodate? Oh yes. And is the GED programming, if you were to need to do review courses or something like that, available for juvenile lifers in the prison system? Uh, yes, that program is available for juvenile lifers. Uh, certainly that's one of the major uh, task that he'll be facing when he comes in is completing that GED. That'll be part of his uh, RNGC requirements. Once Ethan is sentenced, what's the next step for him? Where does he go? Once he's sentenced by this court, uh, he will go immediately to the uh, Thumb Correctional Facility and that will be his intake process. Normally offenders over 18 and over would go to uh, RGC in Jackson but in this case here, the RGC is at the thumb for the youthful offenders. So because of his age, he's treated slightly different than the normal prisoner, but the same as other prisoners of his age, correct? 
Uh, yeah, I would say it's a slight difference. I mean, they, they do uh, have them separate totally from any adults, except for classes where they have an officer with them. So that absence or apart from sight and sound carries forward into the Department of Corrections? Definitely, definitely. Until now, what age? That go, would go up into age 18. And at age 18, what changes? Well, in his case, seeing how he's going to Lapeer to the thumb, he may transfer over to the HIDA, the Homes Youthful Training Act section, which also has youth in it, but it's normally not youth that are under the same circumstances as the uh, juvenile lifers or juvenile uh, uh, commissions of serious crimes. These are generally less serious crimes, but they have a separate section for them but once he's 18, he may be housed with them. And that could be all the way up to age 27 in that particular program. And once he's aged 18, he can um, be housed with other adults, is that true? Yes, and uh, technically he could be transferred to another adult facility. But until the, he's 26, there's a tendency to keep them in facilities with people the same age, is that correct? Uh, depending upon the behavior of the individual, their particular needs for programming, but uh, normally not given a priority unless they come in as a youth. Now, I think you mentioned in your report um, he would be classified. Can you explain what that is? Classified, I probably was referring to security classification. And this is a level of security that he'd be maintained for the safety, security, prevention of escape, et cetera, in the Department of Corrections. And there are, in fact, uh, five different levels of classification, secure one, uh, level one, which is non-secure level one, which is similar to the old camp program, but we don't have camps, but we still have non-secure facilities. Level two would be medium security. Level three is no longer used. And level four would be what they call close. That's one step away from the maximum security. And level five would be maximum security. In each of those different security levels, obviously um, have their own level of security at the facility, correct? Yes, each facility has its own level of security. Some facilities are strictly for maximum security uh, cases, and some are just for level one, non secure cases. In the case of the thumb, that is a level two facility or medium security facility. Now, are you familiar with the term rehabilitation? Yes. And what does that mean? Well, I know it's been bantered around a bit as there is no such thing as rehabilitation. It starts with habilitation, but essentially it means uh, offenders are changing by their involvement in programs, that their behavior is changing, and that they're becoming a better person. Are there certain um, types of programs that you look at in rehabilitation, such as education, employment skills, things like that? All those factors, plus uh, therapy and treatment would also be included. Is there programming for someone in Ethan's position within the Michigan Department of Corrections? Yes, certainly. Is there mandatory programming versus voluntary programming? Uh, as a youth, he's going to be pretty much into a lot of mandatory programming. And we're coming in as a uh, juvenile lifer. If he came in as a juvenile lifer, anyway he comes in as a juvenile, he'll be subject to mandatory uh, therapy. He'll have to go to at least uh, every other week attending uh, mental health treatment. Any other type of programming? There are other, other programming offered, yes. He'll have uh, the education programming. He'll, he'll either go back to ABE and work on completing his high school diploma or working on the GED, and that's something they'll work out with the principal. He'll be involved in different types of treatment programs, and I'm not talking about therapy here, but treatment programs could include, and will likely include, the assault, uh, assault of offender program. This is a program that sometimes is difficult for people serving lengthy sentences to get into. Uh, he will also be involved in the violence, protect, uh, violence Protection or Prevention Program, or the VPP, Violence Pre uh, Prevention. Uh, he'll be involved in substance abuse. If there's some indication he has a substance abuse history, which I don't recall seeing, uh, based upon the records I had. 
he will be reviewed for mental health treatment. Uh, mental health treatment will, again, he will automatically be involved in mental health treatment, whether he agrees to it or not, that will be part of his uh, treatment. But uh, he will also be assessed to see if he needs further or more in-depth mental health treatment. So he will receive a full psychological, psychiatric evaluation. And if that indicates a greater need than every other week, would that service be provided in the Department of Corrections? Yes, it would. And would he be um, participating in any sort of like anger management or cognitive yes. behavior programming? Yes, uh, there is anger management, and that is actually a program. They have a couple of different versions of it, but certainly that's something he would be referred to. Cognitive uh, behavioral uh, programs to uh, they are there, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, uh, where he's able to examine his behavior and his thoughts, what got him into that behavior to begin with. Uh, so yes, these would be programs. Impulse control would be another one he may qualify for. This would all be based upon the referral from the psychiatrist. Now, are there sorts of voluntary programs he can participate in? Yes. And what types of programs would those be? Well, there are community-based programs that come in, which include religious services, which uh, many offenders do participate in. And the religious services usually have a wide variety of programs they're offering in addition to just a weekly religious service. They'll have weekly meetings or even additional Bible study meetings or Quran, whatever it may be, that will go on from that point. There are groups such as Chance for Life. Uh, Chance for Life is a group that uh, works with offenders serving long sentences, uh, especially the younger offenders, and these are, they are mentored by older offenders that have been in the program. And the intent there is to help the person become acclimated to prison and to understand uh, what they need to do while they're in the system. Um, and this program has been very successful. A lot, of, uh, a lot of the youth that have been paroled by the Department of Corrections under the Miller have been involved in the uh, Chance for Life. As mentors or as participants? Well, they had been participants, but by the time they were paroled, I'm sure they were mentors. Now, are what sorts of educational opportunities beyond high school are there in the Department of Corrections? Well, until recently, that was basically it. Uh, and that was because of the law that indicated that offenders could not uh, no longer qualify for Pell Grants. But there are other grants, generally these are private grants that have been made available to the offenders so that they can continue their education in college. So he has the opportunity to attend college classes in the Department of Corrections? He will. And we were speaking about mental health, the treatment. Is there medication involved if his mental health diagnosis requires some sort of medication? Yes, there will probably be psychotropic medication. And is that medication supervised? Yes. It's uh, the medications given out at the med line. The med line has an officer that watches the offender. The nurse also watches the offender as the medication is handed to him, and he has to put it in his mouth, drink it with the water, and then do a tongue check to make sure it was swallowed. What about employment opportunities? Are there any employment opportunities for someone in his position? When he first gets in, he's going to be limited to employment in the uh, youth housing and that will probably be uh, as a porter, um, assistance in serving food, or groundskeeper, um, maintenance type positions, cleaning positions, all right in the housing, the youth housing. And that would be because of his age being under 18? Yes, that is correct. And are those same opportunities available once he turns 18? Well, if he stays in the youth section, again, with the Haida, he probably will have that same kind of employment. If he's put into the GP, which he would qualify for, the general population, then he'd have more different uh, possibilities for jobs. Uh, his, his jobs could include uh, working as a, a clerk in the library. It could be working as a student assistant. It could be working uh, on the grounds, much bigger grounds, obviously, in the general population. Could be working with the maintenance department. I could be working in the laundry, uh, the commissary, so there are many different places he could work in. Now, are there s any sort of risk assessment tools used in the Michigan Department of Corrections? Yes, there are several different risk assessment tools. And could you describe those? We already went w through one of them, which is his classification, security classification. 
But in addition, there is the uh, kind of almost uh, out of practice use, but the risk assessment and the property assessment tools, which are just basically looking at his offense, his age of first offense, and any serious misconduct he may have picked up in the institution. And then there's the property offense, which looks at those same factors, but uh, these two factors generally do not coincide with one another. They may. Uh, he just, just my personal review of the file for what I have uh, known about his background in the offense, he would probably go in as what they call a medium assault risk. And if you were to pick up serious mis institutional misconduct, he'd be made a uh, high assault risk. And are those risk assessment tools used continuously? They are, but not as much as they used to be. Matter of fact, even on the security classification screen, they still have a spot for the uh, uh, high of uh, the property risk. That's, I'm sorry, the risk assessment. So, um, is it a tool that's used to place somebody within a facility within the Department of Corrections? When you're uh, being placed at any facility prior to transfer, uh, or even within the facility itself, there's always rescreening under the uh, security risk classification, at least annually or upon transfer. Or if there's a change, if he were to pick up several uh, serious misconducts, that could change his security risk classification also. Now, you've mentioned you've participated before in reviews of sentences of people who were previously sentenced of life without parole. Uh, in those cases, have some of them been resentenced to life without parole? Uh, yes, they have. And in some of those cases, have they been sentenced to a term of years? Yes, they have. As a matter and of fact, the two were both terms of years. And, and based on your experiences as a warden, deputy warden, and in um, of being a witness, uh, have you done any research about the recidivism rates for people released after initially being sentenced to life without parole? Yes, uh, Montclair College did a study on juvenile lifers that were released, and this was done in Pennsylvania. There are three states that have the highest amount of juvenile lifer offenders, and that's Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Louisiana. So they did a study looking at the rate of recidivism, and uh, they found that only 4% of the offenders released under the uh, Miller decision were rearrested. Out of that 4%, only 2% had committed a new offense. In Michigan, there are no statistics run per se, but the department does keep record. And uh, up to this point, there's roughly close to 200 different offenders that have been released that were juvenile offenders that have been released onto parole. And out of those 200 offenders, uh, during the time since the Miller decision has come down, only one has been charged with a new crime, which is less than 1%. Now, could you explain if Ethan were to get a term of years, the minimum is supposed to be between 25 and 40 under the law. What does that mean? Well, 25 is the minimum sentence and 40 would be the max. If, if that were the way it was done. If it, now, if we're talking about strictly a minimum, then 25, anywhere from 25 to 40 would be the minimum term. So I'm not sure in what reference this is being used. And the maximum penalty under the statute is 60 years, correct? Okay. All right. So the 25 to 40 would be the minimum on the minimum end of a sentence, and the 60 would be the maximum, correct? correct. Yes. So... In a case like this, the judge has the opportunity to sentence somebody to say, for example, 40 to 60 years, correct? Correct. Or 30 to 60 years? Yes. Or 25 to 60 years? Yes, so all those are possibilities. But the absolute minimum would be the 25, correct? If it's that's the range, it's there, yes. Now, um, are you familiar with how felony firearm charges are treated? Generally, felony firearms a flat two-year term. 
and that would be in addition to whatever other sentence was imposed for other offenses? I believe it would be a consecutive sentence, but I'm not positive. So consecutive, you would mean like two plus something, correct? correct. Now, as you're calculating time in the Michigan Department of Corrections, is the minimum sentence what we refer to as calendar days? Basically, the minimum term an offender receives is going to be what you see is what you get. If he got a 25-year term or 40-year term minimum, he's going to serve 40 years on that minimum. There's no longer any good time. The department did away with that back in 1987. Then they converted to disciplinary credits in which the parole board had the uh, authority to grant basically good time. And they did away with that about 15 years after that. So there is no reduction in the sentence. The only reduction would be that of the jail credits that he would receive. And that means jail credits, that he's getting credit on a future sentence for time he's serving now in jail, correct? It would be, yes, in this case, this would be that future sentence. So if he's been in jail one year, he would get one year credit, correct? Correct. And that would go, if you know, if you're not, let me know, to the felony firearm counts, correct? That I do not know. Okay. Now, if he were to be to sentence to, for example, 30 years to 60 years, when he hits the 30-year mark, what happens? Well, really, it doesn't mean he gets out, walks out the door. That just means he's served the minimum amount he needs to serve in prison. So the parole board would then get what they call the PBJ, the parole board jurisdiction. They would review his case and determine whether or not they wanted to, in fact, consider him for parole. And how many people make up the parole board, do you know? Usually it's 10 members together. A majority has to be in favor of any decision, major decision. And what sorts of things does the parole board look at in determining whether to grant parole? First and foremost is danger to the community if released, danger and risk to the public. Is there... I guess, sort of a scoring sheet where they figure that risk out? There is. Can I say if I've seen one or know exactly what's in it? No, I can't. But, yes, they do use a scoring sheet, and they do look at other factors. When I say risk, they're going to also look at his uh, involvement in prison programs, his misconducts, uh, the crime. Uh, all these factors are looked at. Would it be fair to say that someone who doesn't behave themselves or participate in programs is less likely to get out at their minimum sentence? Yes, that is very correct. Now, are you familiar with the term FLOP? Yes. And what does that mean? FLOP means that a person uh, was not given a parole and they'll be considered at some other date. Essentially, they are... In the old, in the days when we had good time, it, it, it had a different connotation, but it's still the same thing. It means they're going to do additional time. The, the board uh, may review it in another five years, but it's actually at the board's discretion whether or not they actually want to interview them at that time. And before they're paroled, they have to go through the interview process as well as this review of what they've been doing while they've been in the Department of Corrections, correct? Right. A parole eligibility report is prepared. And that looks at his entire um, adjustment while he's been in prison, including the misconducts. And just as a note on the misconducts, even though you can't take away from that minimum, you can add to that minimum if you get a major misconduct. So any major misconduct, and it's usually on a scale as to how many days will be added on to his sentence, but if he gets enough major misconducts, conceivably he could be up to his minimum term, although that's, I think, pretty rare to, to see. Now, if he were to be sentenced to a term of years, the maximum being 60, could he be kept until the 60-year mark? Certainly. So he doesn't have to be granted parole, correct? No, and there are a number of offenders that never do see that parole. And is it the parole board that decides how long they're going to flop a person for? Well, they will decide when they will review the person again, yes. 
Now, I, I think we also, we talked about this before. He will be kept at the Thumb Correctional Facility until he's at least 18, correct? Correct. Then it would be up with, to the Department of Corrections to determine whether he stays there until he's about 26, 27? Well, that would just be in the HYTA program that he okay. would be able to stay in that unit. He would not be actually a participant in HYTA. He'd just be in with those offenders. And it's up to the Department of Corrections then where and what facility he gets moved to and how frequently, correct? That is correct. Usually the classification committee at the institution uh, would make a recommendation, uh, and, and generally they go along with that. Now, one of the goals of the Department of Correction is habilitation or rehabilitation, correct? Yes, definitely. That is uh, why it's called corrections. And based on the information you've reviewed as it relates to Mr. Crumbly, have you formed an opinion about his potential to be rehabilitated? I have, but keep in mind I've had very limited information, basically with his records in jail. But uh, honestly, I think everybody has that potential to change. Uh, and, and I think Mr. Crumley would be no exception to that rule. But I think he has to make that choice. He has to be the one to say, I'm willing to change. And he would go about doing that by participating in those programs, the employment, the education possibilities that are available to him, correct? Correct. And if he were to decide he didn't want to participate or be rehabilitated, he would be um, treated by the Department of Corrections accordingly, right? A person that probably sits by idly, not involved in anything, is not going to get a very positive uh, evaluation. Now, if Ethan were sentenced to life without parole, how would the programming be different for him than if he were sentenced to a number of years? The programming wouldn't change either way. Would he still qualify for all of the programs, thumb or any other facility he has available? He would, all dependent upon the level of security. Now, uh, the thumb only has level two. Now, he would probably stay waved down. That means he's moved down to a level two to remain at the thumb. But if he were to go to another facility, they might consider he would likely be a level four, at least until he has that first uh, uh, five years in with the department before he could be reduced down to a level two. So he, he wouldn't automatically qualify to go to any institution that has programs that he's interested in or that they think he should have that security level is going to be the overriding factor. But uh, in most cases, the programs are pretty universal throughout the department, although some institutions only offer certain programs, such as the thumb has building trades, uh, construction trades, etc. And do these programs tend to have a list of people wanting to participate in them? They generally do, yes. And what sort of priority would somebody on a life without parole have on those lists? Somebody doing life without parole would be able to get into building trades. Where it's going to be more difficult is to get into some of the required programming offered by the, uh, the PSU, such as assault and offender programming. That he's going to be put on the back of the list because there are other offenders that are waiting to get out of prison that are close to their parole eligibility date. Um, and those offenders are going to get the priority. And it's understandable why the department does that. They want to make sure these programs are going to be released. The prisoners released do have that programming in advance. When you use the term PSU, what do you mean by that? Psych Services Unit. Thank you. And would his priority, would he keep getting bumped by people who come into the facility that may have a release date? Oh, yes. Yeah, if they have an a, a ERD coming up before his, and uh, again, depending upon his sentence, it's hard to say what that would be, but if theirs is prior to his, he's going to get bumped, and if he's, as you indicated, if he's doing life without parole, he will likely not see that for a long time, if at all. And ERD, which you just referred to, is earliest release date? That is correct. 
I have no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. People Cross? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Romanowski. Good afternoon. Dr. Romanowski, I think this came out late in your testimony. You believe in rehabilitation, right? Yes, I do. And you really believe in it for everybody? I believe that everybody has that potential. Okay. Have you ever met an inmate or a defendant who, after two years of incarceration or a little less, like this defendant, that you would say could never be rehabilitated? No, I've got to admit I have not. Okay. In other words, for anyone in this defendant's position, you would offer the same testimony you offered today about the programs that are available and about the possibility of someone participating in those programs and getting rehabilitated? Yes. Um, Dr. Romanowski, you mentioned previous cases you wor worked on are Miller cases where someone has already been sentenced. In many cases, they had lengthy prison terms already under their belt, right? Uh, yeah, yes, they had certain lengthy periods of time. They might have 30 or 40 years. There are some cases where they have had up to that amount of time. Some had less, some had 15, some had 20, some had 25. And you'll see some who are past that age of 26 when you say the... Most of them are past that age. Okay. And so um, you don't have that in this case? No, we don't. Okay. So you, you can't say where this defendant's going to be in 20 years? No, and it's where this is a bit different from the other Miller hearings that have come down. Would you agree with me that some defendants are more likely to be re rehabilitated than others? I believe that some are going to be a lot harder to rehabilitate. Dr., you mentioned on page, page 5 of your report that you reviewed some emails retrieved from the defendant's parents. I just What are you referring to? Well, I don't think I saw the emails referred from his parents. And actually, the emails that I found in his file were from his grandparents and his aunt. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. So that's, those are jail messages, not things related to prior to the crime. Correct. Okay. One of the things you did mention is the importance of maintaining family ties, correct? Uh, importance of family ties? Yes. Uh, yes, as long as it's a positive family tie. Okay. So that's important in rehabilitation. You agree? Uh, I agree that if you have a good family, or if you've got a supportive family, and uh, it's going to be benefit to you to maintain those ties, you should. But if, on the other hand, if the family has not been a good family, uh, I did not think that would be a good recommendation. So, uh, Doctor, are you familiar with this defendant's parents' actions after his arrest? Yes, I am. Okay, and are you familiar with the text message his mother sent to a friend. And I'm going to read it to you, and you can tell me if you're aware of this. The best lawyer in the world isn't going to get the defendant out of prison, so right now we're taking care of ourselves. Yes, I believe I read that, and where I read it, though, was actually in the news. Okay. And are you aware that his parents drained his bank account? No, I wasn't aware of that. Okay. And so when you talk about the defendant paying for his GED, you're not indicating that he came up with that money. In fact, he came in with zero dollars because his parents had taken all his money. Right. I believe his relatives put the money in his account, okay. other relatives, other than his parents. Um, doctor, did you watch the hearing yesterday? No, I did not. Okay. And did you watch the hearing this morning? Uh, only news clips. Okay. So you didn't hear the victims who were in the school testify? No, I you, didn't. But I know it's horrific. You've never seen the video of the school shooting? No, I have not. All right. You're not familiar with this defendant's history of of obsession with extreme violence, about spending a lot of time on websites that are, they aggregate videos of people being beheaded and cats being boiled alive? No, I'm not aware. I, oh, I did hear that on the news. Um, you've not reviewed the video of this defendant torturing a baby bird? No. Or about his writings about that and how he enjoyed that? No. About his desire to kill and torture, particularly to kill and torture younger victims, not just baby birds, but as he said, little kids. I have heard about it, but I did not uh, see the video or anything to that regard. Are you aware of the way each of the victims in this case was killed? Uh, I know they were shot. Now, I don't think it was execution style. I'm assuming this was uh, random. So, Dr. Romanowski, that's really important. I'm glad you said that. Are you aware the defendant took a gun and strode up to a girl sitting against a locker who had her head covered, put the gun right to her head and executed her? Were you aware of that? Uh, no, I was not. Do you know what happened to Justin Schilling in the bathroom, the last victim who was killed? Uh, I do not, but I believe there was testimony given to regarding one of the other uh, offend, uh, one of the other uh, juveniles that was in the bathroom with him. You heard that testimony? Just 
bits of it coming they, out. They I didn't have lives. He lowered him onto the ground, and he put the gun to the back of his head, and he shot him. He executed him. You were not aware of that before. No, today. I was not. You said there's programming available. That's generally, right? That's not specific to this defendant. There is no programming that is designed to be specific to any one defendant. I just want to ask you about a couple of those programs. You, you're, you're not aware that this defendant needs substance abuse treatment? No, I was not. Okay. You, you mentioned a program that helps with patients. You're not aware that this defendant needs help with patients? Now, when you say patients, do you mean patients such as a hospital patient or patients as in being patient? As in being patient. Yes, there are programs for that. Okay. And you're, are you aware that this defendant doesn't need that? He's got plenty of patients. Uh, I don't know if I am aware he has plenty of patients. Okay. Are you aware whether he has a problem with impulse control? I would assume he does have a problem with impulse control. Okay. You, you're assuming that? Yes. Again, without reference to all of his writings leading up to the crime, of all of his planning, of his getting the gun, and the way in which he killed the victims. So you're, you're saying you think maybe he has a problem with impulse control without knowing the facts? I'm saying that I would still think he has a problem with impulse control based upon his behavior in the jail. You referenced, uh, Doctor, that right now there's no good time for uh, defendants. You, you mentioned that? Uh, right, correct. Unless you were put into the system prior to 1987. Okay, and are you aware that, in fact, right now, like right now, there are bills pending in the Mid Michigan legislature to restore good time credit? You aware of that? No, I'm not. Okay. You know, prosecutors generally oppose that, but that's what's being considered right now. So this defendant could be sentenced, these victims could hear his sentence, and next year he could start getting good time credit. I would think that the law would not be retroactive. But you, you would think that, Doctor. I would think but that. But you'd want to read that bill. In your 44 years of corrections, you said you held ultimate responsibility for the supervision of tens of thousands of prisoners, probationers, and parolees. Is that correct. right? That's correct. You've pretty much seen it all. Well, I won't say I've ever seen it all, because they've not seen it all. All right. Of those tens of thousands of people, how many had carried out a mass shooting? And by a mass shooting, I mean a defendant who had killed more than four people. Well, I've had some that were three people. I had one that was a family of five, so there have been a few, but they're, they're far and few and in between, thankfully. And were any of those terrorists? No. I don't think any of those were charged with terrorism. And have you ever advocated for the release of a mass shooter from prison? Uh, four and more, no. Okay. And of the juvenile lifers released that you mentioned in Michigan, you talked about the recidivism rate being maybe less than 1%. Were any of those mass shooters? To my knowledge, they were not. But again, I'm not aware of all the different crimes that were committed. Now, there was one that did receive a reduced sentence. But again, not four. We're at three. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I have nothing for the honor. Thank you. Defense redirect. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Romanowski, your expertise and your testimony here today as an expert is based on what happens when a inmate walks through the door of the Department of Corrections, correct? Correct. And in this case, you've taken into account the records that you've been provided from the Oakland County Jail, correct? Correct. Now, you're not focused when you are reviewing or when you're working as a warden necessarily with how a person got to your facility, correct? No, I'm not. Now, you mentioned that some people could be harder to rehabilitate, correct? That's correct. But even the hardest person, it's not impossible to rehabilitate them, correct? I believe that is the case. Has there been anybody you've come in contact with where it's been impossible to rehabilitate them? No, what I can't say, there's been any magic touch where every person I've seen has been rehabilitated. That's not the case. So there are people, based on your experience, that haven't been rehabilitated, correct? That is correct. Even though they have the potential, correct? Yes. And you've been um, exposed to inmates that have committed horrific offenses, correct? Correct. And even the most horrific of offenses 
you still believe that there's the opportunity for rehabilitation, correct? Yes, I do. And that's the focus, correct? The opportunity for rehabilitation. Correct. But again, the individual has to make the choice to take that opportunity, take advantage of that opportunity. Now, would you say that somebody that plans something over the course of a few weeks, a few months, still may have impulse control issues? Right. I, I'm not saying that a person didn't plan an, or premeditate a crime. What I am saying is that, yes, there's probably still some impulse control issues there. And the younger a person is when they commit the crime and become involved in the criminal justice system, does that make it more or less likely that they can be rehabilitated? I would almost think more likely, and I base that upon the fact that the juveniles that have been released have the lowest recidivism rate of anybody. The state does well at 24%, but 1% is fantastic. So I, I would say that they have a better chance for rehabilitation, and also these are young offenders, their minds are still subject to change. Does your opinion change about Ethan Crumbly's opportunity to be rehabilitated or likelihood of being rehabilitated based on the facts that the prosecutor just shared with you? Well, I have to say I find those facts to be horribly disturbing. They are, and, and there's no question. But do I still think he has the opportunity to the possibility to change? Yes. Now, the prosecutor also asked you about bills pending to... Um, <coughs> reinstate good time credits, correct? Yes, I'm not aware of it at all. Are you aware of bills that are currently pending to prevent sentencing juveniles to life without parole? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not familiar with that. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. With that being said, any reason why this witness should not be excused? No, Your Honor. No, Thank you. With that being said, doctor, you may step down. You may also leave the courthouse. Please don't discuss your testimony with anyone. Thank you, Your Honor.